Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry, from sensory design experts like Dr. Hobie Wedler, who helps brands think beyond the visual, to today's guest, Bob Polinsky, who's one of only about 45 masters of wine in North America. Today's episode, it's sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, if you're a business looking to retain a winery or craft beverage producer as a client, Barrels Ahead will figure out a plan to make it happen. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Now, before I introduce today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Blake Hershey from SIPT. On last week's show, Blake and I talked about how SIPT is using product-led growth to rapidly build its customer base. Check out last week's show to learn how this growth bundle might be the right choice for your new venture. I am super excited to talk to today's guest, Bob Polinsky. Now, Bob's only one of about 45 Masters of Wine in North America. And if you don't know, the Masters of Wine exam is one of the toughest tests to pass in any field. In fact, when Bob passed the exam back in 2002, he broke a four-year drought of no one passing in North America. Becoming a Masters of Wine launched a second career in wine that has taken him across the wine world. I am super excited to talk with Bob today about his latest ventures. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hey, Drew. Thank you so much for having me here today. Oh, thank you so much for being on. So, Bob, tell us, how did, how did you get in the wine industry? Uh, Drew, this is an unlikely path. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a kid that grew up in Detroit, uh, Polish family, blue collar. Wine was never part of our life in any way, shape, or form. We were beer, vodka, whiskey, all the things that you'd expect mm -hmm. in, in that type of uh, home. And uh, anyway, it was, it was a high school kid. I landed a job in a Metro Detroit wine shop, very nice wine shop. And there I became friends with a, a person who was semi-retired. Uh, the person was a wine geek to no end. And uh, we became friends. And then one day uh, he's in his office. He's having a late night supper like he had every night. And he called me over and said, yeah, I've got something for you to try. And he had this glass of red wine. Here, mm -hmm. try this. Tell me what you think. Drew, I tell you, <laughs> I, I tasted the wine and I just about wretched. <laughs> it was, it was god-awful. He burst, he burst out laughing and he said, here, I have something for you. And it was a book mm -hmm. called Alexis Lachine Encyclopedia of Wine. And oh, yes. Is, yeah. In I its day, <laughs> it's a doorstop. Uh, <laughs> But in its day, it was the gold standard as a reference book. He gave me the book. I went home. I read about the wine. By the way, the wine was a 66 Chateau Catnac Brown, mm. which is, if there's any around today, that potentially is still an amazing bottle of wine. Really? But anyway, we, uh, I came back the next day and I said, you know, I've read about this wine. I've read about some other wines. And this has really got my interest. There's... There's something here about science and art and business. There's a culinary connection. There's a religious connection. And it's all these places around the world that I hope someday I can go to. So that was my big aha moment. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I had a similar one. I had a graduated degree in philosophy and Attic Greek and really didn't drink too much wine until I got a job as a stock boy. And grabbed a similar book. I don't know if it's Alexis Lachine's, but it was one of those books that was published somewhere around 1975. <laughs> and, and, it, and this time it was 93. <laughs> oh, yeah. It sounds very, very similar. And then just immediately kind of shifted from philosophy into just learning everything I could about it, about wine. It was fantastic. Well, and, and so very much the same for me. So, I started as a, a stock boy, you mm -hmm. know, I, I drove a truck, I did all the grunt work you would expect a kid to do. And then uh, I spent five years in that, in that shop. And the last year I became the store manager. Uh, I was just fully, fully, uh, you know, embraced in, in the topic. 
And I just found it absolutely the most fascinating thing. And then uh, at age 23, I had this harebrained idea of, I can open my own shop and do this on my, for myself. Oh, man. Uh, well, armed with a huge amount of enthusiasm <laughs> and, and a will to, to succeed, but not with the, the business skill set that was needed, uh, I struggled for a good solid four years of just paying the bills and, and, and trying to get the business to move forward. And it was very much a, a dinosaur sort of business model. It was one where it was brick and mortar. I knew virtually everyone who walked in the door. I hand sold everything, told a story, and it was a very slow, long grind to get that business up and running. And after about four years or so, that business took off and I ran it for a total of 16 years. Oh, amazing. And the place flourished year after year after the, the, the early struggles. And uh, I sold the business in 2003, uh, or excuse me, 2002, just before I passed the, the MW program. Oh, wow. And, and that's what launched me into a whole different career, which was the, the corporate world. Oh, I get it. No, that's amazing. That's a, that's a great story. You don't hear too many of the, as much as I love independent wine stores, I've worked with them for the last 30 years. It's very tough to ha achieve the success that you guys had. I mean, it, you got to really know what you're doing. Well, and there's this commitment piece. It's nights, weekends, holidays. You're not feeling well. If, if it's a small business and you're the face of the business, you need to be there. Like the, the Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving day. <laughs> well, not Thanksgiving day, but the day before Thanksgiving, one of the busiest wine days of the year. You want to be out with your family, but it's absolutely it's, it's sales time. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And back in that time, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, people are all buying Nouveau Beaujolais. Oh, yeah. You're talking about the, the fad of the day. Or you're, yes. trying, you're trying your hardest to sell the last case of Nouveau Beaujolais. <laughs> <laughs> wondering Absolutely. if you bought too wondering if you bought too many cases so true so true so gosh so you, you were studied for the masters of wine how did that what, where did the idea come to start studying for it and how did that go i've been dying to talk with someone about this okay so so this came about after my business was well established uh business was rock solid things were moving along and my uh my now ex-wife suggested this to me one day. She found a, an article in some magazine and said, I think you need a challenge. Why don't you give this a shot? I had no idea what the Master of Wine program was at that point. Uh, this is back in the mid nineties. Mm -hmm. And I did a bit of research and it caught my interest. And I thought, okay, this looks incredibly difficult, but it also seems to be something that would be extremely gratifying uh, if I'm fortunate enough to make my, my way through it, perhaps this can open up some, some opportunities. And uh, the following year, I signed up for a course and ended up uh, going into the year one program. Uh, and it was uh, initiation by fire. Oh, man. Now, how many year program is it? Talk, educate us on this. Well, it, there, there is no specific time frame on this. Uh, but the way that it works, and it can, the rules can change a bit from year to year. So these things are, are a little bit of a, a bit of a moving target. But typically, the way this plays out is there's a year one program. Mm -hmm. And after that year one program, there's an assessment, a, a mini exam of sort. And if you perform at, a, at an adequate level to move to the next year, you're given the green light. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be asked to come back and reset year one. You may be asked to, to uh, maybe sit out a year. Mm. Uh, now, the, the vast majority of people who go into the MW program have actually gone through the diploma piece on the WSET. Oh, okay. Okay. So the WSET and the MW program, even though they're separately administered programs, it's like the... WSET is the stepping stone into the MW program. Oh, I get it. So that's kind of the undergraduate program. And then you got the MW is the graduate school. Uh, in a matter of speaking, yes. Yes. So with the exam itself, uh, it's a multiple day exam. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it's a written exam. And back when I took it, it was handwritten. <laughs> now most everyone is sitting at a stripped down laptop. Uh, but with, when I sat it, it was all handwritten. Uh, there are three morning sessions. And the three morning sessions include the blind tasting. Mm. And generally speaking, there are 12 wines per day. The questions will vary. Uh, you know, you may get questions as to specific grape varietals, vi- vintage, method of production, influence of weather, market position. I mean, most anything is fair game as long as it's something that you can actually detect in the glass. Mm. And oftentimes you'll be asked to identify not so much a, pr- a specific producer. But it may tie back, if it's a classic region, for instance, it may tie back to a specific appellation in Bordeaux, for instance. And you'd have to say Saint Emilion and then give the reasons as to why you came to that end result. Then there's also multiple days of written essays. And the written essays can cover topics that would pertain to the vineyard, the cellar, uh, social issues, the business of wine, uh, health, a whole variety of, of topics, and then a dissertation. Oh, man. Now, what would you say? Because it's got such a low pass rate. What, 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 is it every bit of these components that contributes to the low pass rate? Or is there one that's like more challenging than others that seems to be the, the big um, hurdle once someone's passed that? You know, it's different for each individual. Uh, I spent some time down in Southern California a couple of weeks ago with a MW buddy of mine, Patrick Farrell. And Patrick was talking about how he struggled with the tasting. Mm. Well, for me, the tasting was relatively easy because it was something that was part of my everyday job. When I say relatively easy, that's a lie. It was not easy. But by comparison to the written part of the exam, uh, I had more confidence in in the blind tasting. Uh, What happens oftentimes, though, is someone may enter the program and they could be a subject matter expert on a limited range of topics. Mm. Well, that'll never be enough to get you through the MW program. It's about having a global perspective, understanding uh, how to solve problems in various parts of the world based on whatever the circumstance may be. Sure. And actually, you, you had a big um, leg up, though, running, a, running your own wine store. You had access to a number of wines that the average person wouldn't have access to, even if you're running it in a restaurant with the amount of just tasting wines for the store and going through all the bad bottles to get to the good ones that you chose for the store really honed your palate, I would imagine. Ho- it, ho- mine. It, it, it's true. Uh, it becomes a lot of repetition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for me, what I always focused on were the traditional growing regions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the classic European regions and then the new world areas that have really established themselves. It could be places like Napa, Marlboro and Stellenbosch and Maipo Valley and, you know, places like that. Um, But knowing the classics is absolutely critical. Does it really focus on the classics? Like how much, what percentage now is the new world wines that are just now coming to market here that people may not be as familiar with? With this exam, you never know. And it's it's a matter of having all the bases covered because anything and everything is fair game. Um, But knowing the classics, for me, it provided a good reference point to everything else. Sure. And and when you go through the tasting, for instance, uh, for a lot of MWs and for a lot of students, they go through a process called funneling. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially taking all the possibilities that a particular wine may be, and then it's deductive reasoning to start eliminating options. And, and you start to eliminate based on, you're looking at color, acidity, alcohol, you know, there's a whole number of factors and they start to take you down a path. And then eventually at the end, you take a leap of faith and say, I believe it's this, mm-hmm. but you take the examiner on a path from start to finish to show how you got to that point. Oh. Is that, I, is that, so if, even if you maybe found it the wrong answer, but you had the right deductive reasoning, do you get partial credit? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
And, and it's all a matter of, of making your case. And if, if your case is logical and it, it's on point, yes, you, you do get credit for, for it. Oh, not, that's as fantastic. Much, not as much as hitting it on the head, but sure. it certainly does get you in the right direction. Oh, that's fantastic. What um, it, I'm actually happy to know that because there is, I mean, there is a right answer and a wrong answer, but there's so many different levels of interpretation as you go through the deduction to be able to reward someone for having that proper thought process. That, that, that's good. What advice, um, so someone today considering to start studying and passing the master's of wine exam, what, what advice would you give for them? Give them? Well, you know, first off, uh, just in your personal life, having, having the time, having the money, being in a position in your life where you can dedicate the time to it. Because for me, and I believe this is true for many, it's like a second full-time job. Mm. Uh, most cases, it takes years to work your way through the program if, if you pass it all. So it's a, it's a huge commitment. Uh, the other piece is having this desire to, to always learn and realize that some of the things that you may have held near and dear may actually not be true. Mm. So uh, being open-minded and, and understanding that problems can be solved in different ways with a successful conclusion, uh, but the recipe for that may not always be the same. Mm. And so having that firsthand knowledge of you know, traveling extensively and, and, and visiting regions and, and understanding uh, why the wines are the way they are is critically important. And, and the exam is always looking for a global perspective. Mm -hmm. So if you compare and contrast, uh, if you compare and contrast Marlboro to Loire, for instance, okay, you may say predominantly Sauvignon Blanc in, in these two regions, but how the wines are made, how they express themselves are very different. And understanding mm -hmm. that and that times a thousand other scenarios, but that sort of mindset is what's needed. Oh, that's, that's, that's fantastic advice. Now, when, once you got the master's wine, what sort of doors did it open for you? What, what happened after, after you passed? Well, after, the, after I passed, I had sold my business and my intent was to go into the corporate world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I held uh, a number of corporate jobs in the U.S. where uh, I, I was director of beverage alcohol for large retailers and had, you know, in, in one case, it was a, like a billion dollar P&L, uh, which is mind blowing for a guy that had a small business. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, culture shock in that regard. Uh, but what it did do is open up opportunities for uh, a lot of these corporate roles. It's how I ended up out in California. And eventually uh, I was recruited by a company in Australia. Mm. And I lived in Australia for a couple of years in Melbourne. I lived there in 2017, 2018. Oh. And uh, so fairly recently, and uh, it's given opportunities to explore the wine world in ways that I could have never imagined. Uh, and then also being in a, in a corporate environment, you know, look, it's all based on performance and mm -hmm. hitting numbers. It would, wouldn't matter if it's, if it's wine or, you know, any other uh, commodity. Uh, and then when I came back to the States, it was time for me to get back into some sort of entrepreneurial role. Uh, so that's when I, I started a, a direct to consumer uh, e com business, which is somewhat like my old retail store, uh, art, artisanal, small production, eco friendly type producers, things you're not going to find in big box. Uh, I work on a number of consulting projects, uh, and there's been a lot of those during the pandemic that have popped up. So that's keeping me busy. And then I'm an old guy who's going to try to launch a YouTube channel. So, awesome. yeah, what's, I'm working what's, with what's the focus of the YouTube channel? Uh, really to uh, it, uh, like a wine education type of, of site, but one that's uh, kind of lighthearted, one that... Uh, looks at wine in a very non-pretentious uh, way, trying to make it more inviting to people, easy to understand, 
hopefully enticing people to try new and different things and just explore. That's so important. Uh, removing the pretension from wine is one of the biggest challenges that I've seen over the last um, 10 years or many years. Even when I got back in, into the industry in 93, there was still that level of um, academic pretentiousness, um, it may call it. What have you seen over the last 20 years going through through the wine or 30 years as you've seen the industry evolve? Oh, well, there's been certainly a lot of changes. And talking about this, uh, if you want to call it this, this pretentious aspect, uh, I think much of this has really been put to rest in recent years. Uh, as you have this millennial uh, generation coming mm -hmm. on board, a lot of these rules have just been thrown out the window. And, you know, I guess it depends on what side of the fence you're on, whether you look at that as a positive or a negative. Uh, for me, I think it's much more of a positive. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It, 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 people are going to be more interested in, in trying wine because there's less barriers. Mm -hmm. And there's not this preconceived notion that you need to know something in order to enjoy it. Mm hmm. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, with like music, for instance. Yeah, I, I listen to and I love listening to music. I can't play an instrument. I can't read music. Mm -hmm. But in my own way, I can enjoy it in a way where it enhances my life. Sure. Uh, but in terms of, of trends in, in the business, uh, you know, the wine business is one where there, it's a lot of uh, like trends and a lot of fads that go through a period of time where they're hot and then they fade. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if you look at the last 25 years or so, uh, if you look at what is happening in the UK, it's oftentimes a very clear marker to what's going to happen in the mm. rest of the world. And if you go back to the days when Muscato just was starting to become a thing, you found that in the UK a couple of years before it hit the States and a couple more years after that, before it hit a place like Australia. Mm. Same thing happened with Melbeck when Argentina really became a, a player in that space. Uh, more recently with Prosecco, uh, you found that in the UK before it made its way to the U S in, in a strong way. Mm. And certainly with Rosé, uh, you know, rosé was big 40 years ago, and now it's, it's back again, and everyone in mm -hmm. their uncle is making a rosé. Uh, but if you look at, at the UK some years ago, all the signs were there that it was coming to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So my feeling going forward uh, is I, the next thing I see being big here, I think Cava is positioned perfectly from Spain. Oh yeah, uh, I was thinking. I was thinking cava from Fiji. <laughs> they, there's, a, there's, a, there. That's their national drink. <laughs> I don't oh, know why I went there. <laughs> okay, you, you, you've got one on me. I had no idea. <laughs> that. Uh, but uh, cava, cava, cava from Spain. You know, the quality is there. The volume is there, and. Uh, I think that's just really positioned well to, to take off. It's already a strong player, but I think it's going to go from strong to much stronger. And the other thing that's got amazing potential uh, that's unrealized to a large extent in the U S is the, uh, is private label wine, mm -hmm. you know, walk into a UK supermarket, walk into a Tesco, for instance, more than half of what they sell is Tesco label or walk mm -hmm. into a market. Spencer and virtually everything is is their own label. Uh, in the states, you're seeing more of that. Uh, you know, places like Costco with Kirkland. You know, they've they've done a, a strong, a really strong job with that. Trader uh, Joe's has a has their strong line of their private labels. Well, yeah, the ever popular two buck Chuck Charles mm -hmm. Shaw. But there's you know it goes way beyond that as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but that private label space. This is where a lot of retailers are going today. Uh, it gives them something that's exclusive, something they can market without worrying about competition. The truth is, in many cases, they're going to make stronger margins on it, which is going to help their, their bottom line. And if they do it well, it really plays into what's happening in the rest of the store. You know, you see 
private label product, whether you're buying, you know, pasta or whatever. Oh, yeah. We're already. So it's not that much of a leap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were b- back in the day, I had a private label company, um, Vintelect, but that's another story. The The trend that I do <laughs> see is... Um, Back in back in you know the late nineties two thousand, a lot of the private labels were so designed that they didn't look like private labels. You couldn't tell that it was a private label. It looked like a cellar. It looked like a winery to the average person on the shelf. Today, you see like the Kirkland brand. You see the Trader Joe's brand, and the stores are actually attaching their name to the to the wine. In, in some cases, yes. In some cases, yes. Uh, you know, every retailer's got a different approach on it. Uh, but from what I can see, the the appeal that private label brings is just climbing quickly. So yeah. I, I think it's going to become a, a much stronger player. And look, there's there's companies that are set up all over the place now that are built just for that purpose. Mm-hmm. All these custom crush operations, they're they're everywhere, and um, you know it's it's coming, mm-hmm. it's, it's coming. So if you're a brand owner, you know it's prepare yourself because the competitive landscape is, is going to shift. Uh, that, that's great advice. What, here's, a, here's a question. Um, with the latest trend towards seltzers and um, you know, spike tonics, the wine industry is now they're cutting into the wine's market share. Where, where, where do you, how do you think wine should be positioning itself in relation to you know, the seltzer market and the spike tonics? Yeah, well, for starters, Look, until very, very recently, the wine industry was a dinosaur when it came to innovation mm-hmm. and you know, very, very stagnant in terms of how it looked at, at people who were buying the, you know, their product. And uh, it's a little bit of trying to play a game of catch up at this point. Uh, you know, I've seen that there's, there's some other products that are coming out now that are going to be wine based mm-hmm. and they're going to be flavored with it could be with some sort of fruit juice or some other type of of, of additive and i think that's partly going to try to counter uh what you've seen with with seltzers but seltzer has just changed the industry you know it's come on so quickly and it's been so strong Mm -hmm. uh for the wine industry it's been very reactive instead of proactive uh you know i i think it'll sort itself out and and wine's always going to have a place uh, someone who sorts it out the quickest and the most efficient is going to be the one who reaps the benefit. Yeah. So, um, I was at that's the, a, that's a we tough talked one. about it a lot at the Oregon wine expo, not this year, but last year was really, there, that was a huge topic at a lot of the, the talks and symposiums and the, mm. the, the miss, the, not the miss, but the conception among the Gen Z's, um, millennials that seltzer is a much more healthy beverage. Is was is shocking to the wine because wine was always considered the healthy the healthy alternative, but to the kids today that were ra- kind of raised on juice is bad, juice is bad. Wine is just basically alcoholic juice, and then they see the seltzer as water with alcohol and being a little more healthy. And the challenge is, how does wine, um, you know, it, with putting the ingredients on the label, how does wine kind of right. restore that kind of right. health perception with the with the youth? You know, uh, wow. Okay. You, you've caught the, the old guy, a little flat footed. Uh, what I would say to that is one counter to that is something that's already starting to play out. Uh, and that is this, this movement towards uh, much more eco-friendly mm-hmm. product or wine. You know, you're finding there, there's a, a very quick uh, growth in uh organically grown fruit, mm-hmm. uh, you know, wines made with, with no enzymes, there's no coloring agents, uh, you know, indigenous yeast is, is something that's becoming much more common, even though in some places that's extremely challenging to, to, to happen, but you're finding that build. Uh, you know, also, even the vegan piece of it, it's hard to believe, but you know, there's, there's still wines out there that are truly not vegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's some changes going on there. As you mentioned with the labeling, I've seen some brands that have gone out and you know, they're actually listing all the ingredients on the label. Uh, so transparency, I think, is a step in, in the right direction. 
That, that's, that's excellent advice. So shifting a little bit. So Bob, tell me about some of your latest ventures. You mentioned you have the, you have that online wine marketplace with artisans stores. That's called um, Stellar Bottles, I believe. Correct. Yes. Yeah, t- talk to me about some of these ventures. We, at the pre-show, it was, I was pretty excited to hear about them. Uh, so I'd say one I'm working on that I think is really interesting. Uh, it's a brand that's been around for about five years. It's called Tattoo Girl. Oh, and it's a wine that's produced in Washington State. Uh, there's five wines that make up the brand. There's a Riesling, Chardonnay, Rosé, Red Blend, and a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, I'm the guy who put together the final blends. Mm. So I've, I've worked with the winemakers on it. But the project I find interesting because it's, it's a brand, even just the name of it, mm-hmm. it conjures up this image of being very individualistic and expressive. And, and my intent is the wines reflect that same image. So, you know, if, if it's a red blend, for instance, it's got a lot of depth and weight and character, and it's, it's just something that will really grab your attention. At least that's my hope. Uh, and what I see in the wine industry today is one of the most important pieces that if you can capture this, you've got lightning in a bottle, and that is the emotive link. Mm. So if there's a brand that has some sort of lifestyle calling out and it resonates with an audience, you don't need to be all things to all people. Just have that loyal, solid audience and you can build a successful brand. And that's the path that this uh, Tattoo Girl uh, brand is going down. So it's To me, it's exciting to watch this. It's a brand that uh, last year was around 10,000 cases. This year, it looks like they're going to have no problems hitting about 50,000 cases. And there are international markets that are developing now as well. Oh, wow. And all this is based on is someone seeing that label and it captures their interest. So uh, it's interesting just to watch how this plays out. But... uh, that's a fun project. I, that I'm sounds fantastic. Did, that. did they source their grapes throughout Washington or are they centered in a particular region? Uh, it's a few different regions within Washington. Uh, there is no Tattoo Girl winery. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a custom crush. And so it's, what happens is there's a team of winemakers uh, and the wine, uh, there's two wineries actually, one called Ancient Lakes, one called uh, Waluk. Mm-hmm. And they have a, a team of, of very buttoned up professional uh, winemakers. They have huge vineyard holdings. And essentially, you go there. In the case of me, I went there, spent a few days with these people. And this is exactly what I want for this brand. Mm. Spend a day in a lab putting these, these wines together. And it's the opposite of what you used to find many years ago, where traditional Regions in Europe, for instance, in Bordeaux, let's say, a producer would make their wine and then go out and try to find a customer for it. Mm-hmm. Today, that's flipped on its head. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a matter of I understand who the customer is and I need to deliver what they expect. Mm. So it's, to me, it's a fascinating project. I, I love it. Yeah, no, that is, that is fascinating. I like the figure out what the customer wants, then make it. Rather than build a build a field and the people will come. It sounds simple, but that's not the way the wine industry operated for many years. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I'm glad someone's pushing it forward, delivering something people want. Yeah. So, what else are you working on these days? Oh, well, a number of other things. With uh, I'm working on some private label projects mm-hmm. uh, that are going to be linked to some other uh, large retail chains. Uh, I've done this for many, many years. When I, when I worked in Australia, that was my prime responsibility. Uh, so once the world opens up and I can travel again, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be doing that to fulfill some of the uh, demands for these other consulting roles. Um, I'm also working with another uh, label that I find very interesting, another lifestyle type brand. Uh, it's called Aveline. Mm. And Aveline's been around for only about eight months now. Uh, I guess maybe it's closer to a year. And it's a, it's a brand tied to uh, uh, two women, uh, one named Catherine Power and uh, Cameron Diaz. Mm. And uh, this brand has taken off uh, 
in a way that's just shocking. And it's, it's really geared towards a millennial um, mm -hmm. customer base. Their messaging has is, is been very clear and direct and all the early signs are extremely positive. Oh, that's fantastic. So I'm doing some of the sourcing work for them. Oh, that's great. When you're, so when you're not consulting and not, um, you know, building businesses, what, what do you like to drink when you're off the clock? Oh, uh, well, uh, look, I think maybe this is maybe a bit of a function of age. Uh, <laughs> you know, I look at my, my wine cellar next to me and it's loaded <laughs> up with all these big, heavy, heavy reds, but uh, I'm drinking lighter, lighter style whites for the most part. Uh, I'm still drinking a lot of champagne. I love that. I love Cremont. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent some time in Northern Italy last year, just before the pandemic really took off. And I am hooked on the wines from Alto Adige. Oh, yeah. The, the very Northeast part of Italy. Uh, I mean, wonderful, wonderful whites. Uh, I can't get enough of those. And the other thing, I feel like I can drink an extra glass and it's not going to hurt me. That is why, yeah, I, for me, if I'm, my go-to, it needs to be under 14%. 13.5 is about right. I okay. start to cringe when I'm at 15%. I know I got, I can't, I can't drink the bottle. Okay. So, so with that, <laughs> I'm going to contradict what I just said. <laughs> there was one thing that I'm still hooked on and I love really top-notch California Zen. Mm. That's Russian River one. Valley. I, I'm just, it's so distinctive. It's got so much character. Uh, you know, I described it with a friend of mine. I described uh, the Zen as it's a little bit like going to like some really cool dive bar. <laughs> you have no idea what's going to happen. You just know it's going to be fun. That is so, a great way to describe that. <laughs> so that, that's what I find with Zen. Uh, but you're right. 15% alcohol. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's fun. That's something I want every day. <laughs> now. <laughs> so what, what do you like? I know you're pretty good at the kitchen. What do you, what do you like making with your Zen? Oh God. You know, well, during the pandemic, like most everyone, you know, I Greco Roman Russell making sourdough bread where maybe 50% of the time it turned out great. And the other 50% <laughs> of the time it was a doorstop. Uh, well, oh, the things I, I like to cook now, uh, uh, I love North African cuisine, Ooh. like Moroccan type cuisine. Uh, I wouldn't have that with Zen. You need something a little more lower alcohol because the heat in the Zen just accentuates heat in the food. That would tie uh, your whites. <clears throat> right. <laughs> uh, I do love that, that sort of food. And I've been doing a lot of Asian dishes, uh, a lot of things with uh, seafood. Mm -hmm. And again, I must be behind the times, but I am, I am hooked on the air fryer. That's the coolest <laughs> thing. That is the coolest thing. Yeah, those, those are pretty cool. I, we don't have one yet, but I, my, my, my wife has a moratorium on new tools for the kitchen right now. So I've got to oh, wait for my air fryer. <laughs> well, this should be at the top of the short list, given the chance. Oh, I will. I will make it. So Bob, as we're wrapping down, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me uh, on uh, StellarBottles.com. You can find me there. Uh, you can also find me on the MW website. Uh, it'll have contacts there. Uh, you know, anyone that might be looking for you know some sort of consulting role, I'm you know I'm always open to those conversations. And um, yeah, I'm not I'm not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're looking to revamp your latest brand. Bob Polinski is the guy to go to. Thank you so much today for talking with me. Uh, Drew, I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Ha have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.